Welcome to Spine Academy. This is the first chapter in a series on cervical spondylosis. You can think of cervical spondylosis as age-related degeneration of the cervical spine, or what you might colloquially know as cervical arthritis. In this chapter, we're gonna talk specifically about cervical anatomy. So it's meant for the viewer who's really not that familiar with the cervical spine, and it's meant really to orient you to the numbering and the shape of different structures in the cervical spine. So we're gonna break it into a few different areas. We'll talk about the structural components. We'll talk about the bony anatomy and the numbering of the different blocks that make it up. We'll talk about the intervertebral discs, the anatomy of a disc, and also its relationship to some of the structures around it. We'll talk about the ligaments that hold all of that together. And that, in composite, makes up the structural part of the cervical spine. We'll also change gears and talk a little bit about neurological structures that are part of it as well. So that would include the spinal cord, include the spinal nerves, and just understanding what those are and how they work on a high level is part of what our objective is with that. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, is to understand the intimate relationship between all of these different structures, between the bony, disc, and ligament structures, and the nerve structures that are in close proximity to them. All of these structures are things that together make up what we fondly know of as the cervical spine. So in this next section, we're gonna talk about the bony elements of the cervical spine. So that is the skeletal part of the neck. Now what we're looking at in this picture is really beautiful. You can see the cervical spine is what connects the skull to the chest. So that's the rib cage and the thoracic spine, which would be down here. You can see here as you roll through this, there's seven blocks in the neck. This is looking at it from the front right there. That simple structure is what confers all the motion in your cervical spine or in your neck. Now, if you were to break it down and just look at the vertebral bodies themselves, this picture, as you roll through it, you can kind of see the top two blocks, C1 and C2, are a little bit different from all of the other vertebral bodies. C3 down looks very similar, and you can kind of see here's the back part of the neck, here's the front part of the neck. We're gonna drill down on that a little bit better in a couple of slides. Now, when you look at the structural elements of the uh, spine, just looking at it from the side. This picture right here, we uh, want to show that here's the front of someone's face. You can see where the neck is. This is roughly to give you a sense of the proportion. Again, the C1 and C2 blocks look a little bit different. They act a little bit different. Most of your ability to turn your head really comes from this joint right there. So it's a very important kind of joint. Everything below that from C3 down looks very similar. So you can see one, you can see two, and then all the three to seven below that. So if you were just to look at a single bone, like if we looked at this and we said, hey, we really wanna just look at one single block, because you can get lost in that picture. Here you can see very nicely, here's the C5 vertebral body as we kind of roll through it. The C5 body I just kind of pulled out as a sample because it looks very similar to C3, C4, C7, et cetera. But if we were to take that one block out and look at it, this is what it would look like. So here we're looking at it from the top down. This is a picture looking at the front of the spine. This is the back of the spine here. This is looking at it from the side. So the front of the spine, the back of the spine over here. So what's neat about this is you can really kind of see very, a couple of very important structures when we're getting in on that. But one thing to notice right here is that this hole right in the center of it is called the spinal canal. You stack all these blocks up, that's what makes the spinal canal. And that is where the spinal cord itself sits. So the important structures that we want to highlight when we're going through a single uh, segment is we want to look at the components that make up that segment because these are terms that you're going to hear as we talk about things in future chapters. So the most important structure to really talk about would be the vertebral body. That's the front part of the spine. This looks a, a little bit like a tuna can. It's cylindrical. So looking at it from the top, you can see it's kind of an oval. Looking at it from the side, you can see it's a rectangle. That's a solid piece of bone. When you stack them all up, that's what makes up the spinal column. Now, there are structures that hang off the back of that, and the next probably most important structure to really talk about is the pedicles, which are small structures that connect the front part of the spine with the back part of the spine. And these can be small, three, four millimeters even in size, but that's what connects you from a bony standpoint front to back. When you go to these structures in the back, you can kind of see here there's a couple of interesting structures. The lateral mass. Now, the lateral mass is a paired structure, right and left. 
It's the back part of the spine, and here you can kind of see it here. It looks like a parallelogram when you look at it from the side. That stack of blocks, one on the left, one on the right, really helps your ability to have constraint. It's easy to lean forward, lean back. It's a little more constrained in terms of turning and bending from side to side, and that is a byproduct of the shape of these lateral masses. And then really to close out the spinal canal in the back here, we're looking at a couple of very important structures. There's something called the lamina here. That's a term you'll hear when we talk about removing the lamina for a laminectomy. You've probably known somebody uh, who has had a laminectomy in their lifetime. That is an important structure that forms the back part of the spinal canal and something that we'll remove when we're doing a laminectomy to kind of open up the canal. And then lastly, there's this structure right here, which is the spinous process. And that's the structure that you can kind of feel when you feel the back part of your neck. That little knob that you're feeling, that's the spinous process. So that's a single vertebral body, right? That's looking at C5, just as a representative of what we're talking about. But now if you put them all together again, this animation shows very nicely how they stack together. So here's that spinous process we just talked about. Here's the lamina here. Here's the lateral mass here. As you come around here, you can see there's some portholes we'll get into later. And then here is the stack of vertebral bodies from the front. C1 and C2, again, look a little bit different. C3 down, these all kind of look the same. This is the subaxial spine once again. Now we'll talk a little bit more. That's the stack of blocks, but now what connects these blocks? There are a couple of important types of structures. Between the C3 and C4 level, looking at it from, from the front, there's this kind of spongy structure called an intervertebral disc. And an intervertebral disc is a collagenous structure that has some flexibility. Think of it as a shock absorber or a cushion or something like that that's separating these blocks of bone. A block of bone is very rigid, it's structured, there's no pliability in that, but like the way you get your motion is as a byproduct of these structures. So the disc itself and the ligaments that we'll talk about in a little bit, those are the structures that have some pliability to them. They're kind of elastic structures. They're also wear, wear items. These are the things that wear out over time, like tires in your car or gaskets or other things like that, because they tend to get used over, over the lifetime. So this is the disc between C3 and C4, it's called the C3-4 disc. Between 4 and 5, similarly, you have a structure called the C4-5 disc. That numbering nomenclature, when people get sometimes confused when you say, oh, C4-5, we're talking about one structure, it's between C4 and C5, and it's numbered C4-5. That's just one structure, even though there's two numbers in it. So if you think about a single disc, a single disc looks like a radial tire. I tell people it's like a tire. It has a very dense kind of steel band on the outside of it that forms a very robust kind of set of layers that really give it its strength. And then the inside of this is like a jelly donut. So it's another analogy people often will hear is that your disc is like a jelly donut. There's jelly on the inside and donut on the outside. Now the donut part of this is pretty tough. It's actually designed to last you a lifetime. It's got a bunch of layers of very dense fibrous collagen that make that up. The inside of it is kind of pulpy, so it's a little bit juicier, it's kind of spongy, it's what gives it the sponginess. And that single structure, that jelly donut, if you will, we call an intervertebral disc. Now, if the jelly itself herniates out, and you may have heard of somebody who's had a herniate, or you may have had yourself a herniated disc, that piece that herniates out can come out kind of any side here, but where you really feel it is when it kind of comes out towards here. You can see how the disc kind of projects in that direction, but it lends itself to herniations that are out in this direction. If you squeeze on that nerve that's running out the side there, you'll start feeling symptoms depending on where that nerve is. That's something we'll talk about later when we talk about pathology in the cervical spine. But recognizing the relationship between this structure and the structures around it. Here's the spinal cord. I mean, look how close it is. Like, it's very easy for a problem here to turn into a spinal cord problem. And that's something that we can talk about in greater detail in the future. So outside of the discs, which are hidden on this picture, but again, you all know this now as experts, that between C4 and C5, there's a disc back there. But strapping the whole spine, so you have the stack of blocks, you've got discs between them. Strapping all those blocks together are a set of ligaments that are really important because they're, they're, they're elastic, they're flexible, but they're really tough. And they're basically joined to each of these vertebral bodies, like scotch tape that are kind of stuck along the perimeter of them that permit the bodies to move in all these different directions, but with constraints. In the setting of trauma, sometimes these will break, but they're designed to last you a lifetime. And so the ones that are really important, you can kind of see here the front of the spine, that's called the anterior longitudinal ligament. As we roll around the spine, you can see there's some importance. There's something called the ligamentum flavum here. You can kind of see it on both sides underneath the lamina. 
in the back, you can see the inner spinous, supraspinous ligaments and the nuchal ligament, and then wrapping back around to the front, the anterior longitudinal ligament. Those are probably the most important ligaments to be aware of, and it's not really critical that you know the names of them. We don't necessarily, when we go do surgery, we often have to, to manipulate those or take those out. It's not critical, but it's important to recognize that these stacks of blocks will make up the cervical spine. That stack of blocks is kind of strapped together by these ligaments that give it some flexibility, but also constrain its motion. So now that we've talked about the musculoskeletal part of the cervical spine, so that was the bones, the ligaments, the discs that kind of strap them all together, it's important to talk about the neural elements or the nerve elements that are intimately related to them. We alluded a little bit to it when we were talking about the spinal canal, but it's, well, let's just take a step back and talk about what the nervous system architecture itself is. So the nervous system really starts in the brain and it works its way down. It's this amazing network of these conductors that send signals from the brain down into your arms and legs and conduct signals from your arms and legs all the way back to your brain. So your brain knows what's happening and is able to conduct all of this different uh, signaling that's necessary. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. And you can see here, this is the brain. Right at the bottom of the outflow here is called the brain stem. And then below that is the spinal cord. And the spinal cord is really continuous with the brain stem. Once it leaves the brain or leaves the skull, the brain stem becomes the spinal cord. So the spinal cord here you can kind of see is the structure that runs up and down from the level of the skull all the way down to the bottom of your thoracic spine. I use this analogy that your spinal cord is like a tree trunk the branches that come off of it are the spinal nerves. So the tree trunk is really responsible for conducting all the signals from the roots all the way up into the branches and the leaves and backwards as necessary. In the same way, the spinal cord is responsible for conducting signals from the arms and legs through these spinal nerves until they enter these main tracks, which are like major pathways that go up to different parts of your brain. And then vice versa, from the brain down through the spinal cord, through these different tracks, into the spinal nerves and out. So the brainstem itself is a really important, the spinal cord are important structures in all this. And just as a nomenclature, uh, we think of the central nervous system as the brain and spinal cord, everything beyond that as the peripheral nervous system. This next animation means to show the spinal cord and the nerves in relation to the structures around them. So this is a nice kind of picture looking this time, highlighting the brain, the spinal cord, and the spinal nerves that leave on either side. What's important to recognize here is that the spinal nerves leave the spine, the spinal column, and they become part of a more intricate network as you leave on both sides. This here is called the brachial plexus, where the nerves will kind of intertwine with each other to become peripheral nerves that descend down into your arm and conduct signals all the way out, and once again, all the way back again. And next, we're gonna talk really about how the nerves and the spinal cord relate to the musculoskeletal spine that we talked about before. So now that we've spoken about both the musculoskeletal part of the cervical spine, and we've talked about the neural architecture in the cervical spine, the spinal cord and the spinal nerves, let's talk about how those things come together. Here's a very nice picture that illustrates not only the vertebral bodies and the disc, but also the spinal cord and the spinal nerves and their close proximity. You can really see how the nerve is right next to the pedicle, right next to the disc and the back of the vertebral body, right next to the joint here, and problems there can cause encroachment on the spinal nerves. Problems in the center of the canal can cause encroachment of the spinal cord. The spinal cord runs up and down or longitudinally in the spinal canal and can be affected at multiple levels. And how many levels it's affected at will have implications in how we treat things as well. The spinal nerves are the branches that come off one on the left, one on the right, that leave through a small hole called the neural foramen. This is a picture that shows the neural foramen a little bit better. So here you can see the spine is kind of pointing towards me here. Here's the vertebral bodies. Here's the discs in between. Here you can see a very small window, and this is a nerve leaving the spinal cord through something called the neural foramen. Some people will call it the neuroforamen, the neural foramen, or just the foramen. So people will talk about foraminal stenosis or neuroforaminal stenosis to be narrowing of this small window that this nerve is leaving through. And it can be caused, now that you understand the anatomy around it, it can be caused by the discs or some bone spurs up here. It can be caused by bone spurs or kind of arthritic stuff going on in the back there. All of that encroachment will kind of close in around the nerve and cause something called foraminal stenosis. This is a picture that really shows very nicely the spinal column, the ligaments, the discs, and the nerves in a single kind of animation here. One of the things to notice, again, these ligaments that we had spoken about, the spinous processes, there's a very small window, that foramen we just talked about. And what you can see here is that really the spinal column and the spinal nerves are intimately related. 
So from a numbering standpoint, we talked again about C1 down to C7. Between C4 and C5, you can see there's a disc there, which is the C4-5 disc. We'd spoken about that as well. But what's important to recognize is that that same level, you can see a nerve on one side and a nerve on the other side, that is the C5 nerve. So the C5 nerve comes out between C4 and C5 at the level of the C4-5 disc, and it's numbered that way because it sits right on top of the pedicle of C5. So this is the nerve kind of coming out the side there. One very interesting artifact of this numbering system is that right at the bottom of the spine, between C7 and T1, is a nerve called the C8 nerve. There is no C8 vertebral body. This is a nerve between C7 and T1. The nerve that goes out between T1 and T2 below that is the T1 nerve. So this is almost like an extra nerve, but it's just a byproduct or an artifact of the way that these have been numbered. When we talk about dysfunction at a disc, we talk about, again, C4-5. It has two numbers in it, can be a little bit confusing. Vertebral bodies, just one number, the C3 body, the C4 body, nerves are the same. The C5 nerve, the C8 nerve. When we talk about dysfunction of a nerve, it's called radiculopathy. In general, radiculopathy should be a C5 radiculopathy, a C6 radiculopathy, not a C5-6 radiculopathy. And you'll see that a lot in EMGs and other studies, but it's really important to recognize that a nerve is just one number associated with it. So that is kind of tying all those structures together. And again, this is a very beautiful illustration putting everything together. You don't see all the nerve stuff here, but one of the things you notice is that the vertebral bodies themselves strap together. Here's a disc here. Here's the vertebral body. Here's that foramen right there that the nerve would come out. These structures together allow for flexion, extension, turning your head, a lot of complicated motions that permit your spine to move in the neck and give you a lifetime worth of uh, neck range of motion all while trying to protect the spinal cord and spinal nerves that run right down the center of that. So that is the anatomy in a nutshell of the cervical spine. In this chapter, we've really covered a lot of territory. We've spoken about the structural parts of the cervical spine. We talked about the vertebral bodies. We talked about the discs. We talked about the ligaments that hold them all together. We've also spoken about the neurological components of the cervical spine. So we talked about the cervical spinal cord, we talked about the spinal nerves, and very importantly, we talked about the relationship between those skeletal portions, so the discs and the ligaments and the bones. We talked about the relationship of those structural components to the neurological components that are right next to them, and they're intimate, like the spinal cord is surrounded by bony structures, ligamentous structures, disc structures. In the next chapter, we're gonna talk much more about cervical spine imaging. So we'll talk about the types of imaging that patients often will have performed, including MRIs, CAT scans, x-rays, kind of explaining what they are and also explaining how to interpret your own imaging. So if you wanted to pull up your own imaging, you would have some rudimentary understanding for what you were looking at and how we would interpret them. I think with that chapter, my goal really is to help you be better informed. So when you see your doctor and they talk to you about your images or show you your images, you have some better understanding of what you're looking at. So thanks for watching this chapter. I hope you've learned something valuable and I look forward to seeing you in the next chapter.